Howdy. My name is Nonat, and welcome to my deep dive into the Champion class for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. If you're not aware, this is part two of the deep dive, as part one covered all of the subclasses for champions. If you haven't seen that one, you can check out part one right over there where we go over the six causes for champions. In this one, we're going to be going over everything else. Oh, but before we get started, I just real quick, I need to offer a prayer to my deity. Dearest algorithm, please give us your boon. Show my video to the masses. Give me the strength to create and give the viewers the power and drive they need to smash that like button, hit subscribe, and maybe even check out my Patreon in the description to help support the channel. Thank you, O oh Algorithm, and your gracious, gracious divine light. Okay, thanks guys. Let's talk about champions. So starting off, champions have a weird key ability in hit points, honestly. They only get 10 hit points per level. It is understandable, as the Barbarian's 12 hit points per level is one of their big selling points. Barbarians have always had more hit points than other classes. But champions cannot pick Charisma as their key ability score. On the surface, this might not seem like a big deal, but as we get a little bit farther in, you'll start to notice there's some issues with that. They can only pick Strength or Dexterity as their key ability score, and while useful, I feel like Strength or Charisma might have made a little more sense. I'll be honest, throughout this deep dive, I might be a little more opinionated than normal, because I have a lot of feelings about the champion. It's a class I think had so much promise and so much potential, but has unfortunately fallen flat. I'm going to try not to slow the video down with these opinions, but they will be coming out from time to time. Champions are trained in perception, trained in reflex saves, and expert in fortitude and will saves. They also begin with the religion skill, one or more skills determined by their deity, as well as two plus their intelligence modifier in additional skills. They're trained in all weapons and trained in all armor. Simple as that. Overall, very basic starting proficiencies. Not too bad, not too groundbreaking. Like I said, if you haven't watched part one already, I highly recommend it because we are skipping over the entirety of the champion's code as well as all of the class features that affect it. So if you're not sure about champion causes or the champion's code, I highly recommend checking out part one before going forward. All champions get deific weapon at level one, which is a really lame class feature that only affects you if you are using a simple weapon, and that weapon happens to be your deity's favorite weapon. You gain access to it, so even if it's an uncommon weapon, you do have access to it upon character creation. And if the weapon is a simple weapon, such as a club or a dagger, then the damage die does go up one step. This is mostly just to make champions of a deity who uses a simple weapon a little more viable, because otherwise, a champion with a simple weapon would just be worse. So it's understandable, it's just a really boring feature that makes your club a d8 instead of a d6. I talked about it in part one, but all champions do get devotion spells, which are just focus spells and function just like the focus point system in any other class. The only other thing champions start with at level 1 is a level 1 feat and the shield block general feat, which is nice. They can already use their shield to reduce incoming damage at level 1, which I would certainly hope they could. At second level, they get skill feats, and then at third level, they get what should have been such a cool feature, but it's not. Divine Ally. You choose one of three different divine-infused allies to aid you on your quest. A blade ally, a shield ally, or a steed ally. Should you choose the blade ally, then once per day during daily preparations, you can choose one weapon and imbue it with one of the following runes. Disrupting, for a little more damage to undead creatures. Ghost Touch, which allows you to hurt incorporeal beings. Returning, which lets you throw it and it comes back to you. And Shifting, which lets you turn it into a different kind of weapon. You do get the weapon's crit specialization effect, which is fine, but that's all this does at third level. The Disrupting and Ghost Touch are nice to have on hand, but if you're not fighting any kind of undead or spirits, you're pretty much stuck with returning and shifting, which don't do that much, all things considered. 
Shield Ally is at least a little more effective, if not a bit boring. It increases your equipped shield's hardness by 2, and increases its hit points and broken threshold by 50%. So if a shield had a hardness of 5 and 20 hit points, it now has a hardness of 7 and 30 hit points. Definitely not bad, and a direct upgrade to your shield, but overall, it reduces damage by 2 more when you shield block. And Steed Ally is just strictly the best one because it gives you an animal companion. It does have to be a horse unless your GM allows you to take something else, but it still gives you a horse animal companion which lets you command it, give it extra actions, take more actions on your turn. It's overall just so much better than Shield and Blade Ally. It's not really a competition how imbalanced this is. General feats, skill increases, ability boosts, and ancestry feats. We're not worried about that. Level 5, weapon expertise gives them expert with martial weapons like most martial classes except for fighters they only reach expert at fifth level armor expertise does let the champion finally start standing out where they get expert proficiency with their armor giving them a net plus two to armor over their allies at seventh level just for reference fighters don't get this until 11th level so this does finally give the champion a leg up somewhere over other martial classes they also get Weapon Specialization at level 7, which works the same way as other classes. 2 bonus damage if you're an Expert, 3 if you're a Master, 4 if you're Legendary. At 9th level, they become an Expert in their Class DC, as well as an Expert in Divine Spell Attack Rolls. At level 9, they get their Divine Smite, which I covered in Part 1. But also at level 9, they do get 2 really solid increases. Fortitude increases to Master and begins to automatically critical succeed any normal successes, and their reflex saves go up to Expert, a really solid level for their saving throws. Level 11 finally increases their perception to Expert, they have stayed at Trained this entire time, and increases their will saves to Master and automatically crit succeeds normal successes. So by level 11, they are a Master in Fortitude and will saves, which are really, really solid. Also crit succeeding on both of them. Really good stuff. Level 11's Exalt, I've covered in part 1. Level 13's Armor Mastery once again pumps the champion ahead of the game. With Master Proficiency in Armor, their armor class will be second to none in the base classes. I also should have mentioned that back at 7th level, the champions do get the Armor Specialization for all of their armor. What this means, without going too into detail because there's a bit to it, is that each set of armor gains resistance to a specific type of damage. For example, leather armor has resistance to bludgeoning damage. It's not a lot. It's usually, I think, 2 plus the potency rune, but that does reduce all damage of that type forever. Pretty good. They also reach master proficiency with their weapons. At 15th level, their weapon specialization damage doubles. At level 17, they become a master in their class DC, as well as a master with divine spells. But most importantly, at level 17, they are the only class to achieve legendary proficiency with their armor. This does mean that champions, especially if they have a solid shield, will have an unparalleled armor class compared to any other character in the game. This right here is one of the main reasons that champions, in my opinion, are one of the best archetype bases in the game. No matter what archetype you want to pick you'll be able to have legendary armor proficiency with any kind of armor in the game. Even if you go with something like the martial artist archetype, this still gives you legendary in unarmored defense, meaning a dexterity-based champion can be just as agile and have a high of an AC as a monk. And finally, one of their only unique class features outside of their reaction upgrades, Hero's Defiance. For a level 19 class feature, this is honestly kind of underwhelming. Should an attack be about to bring you to zero hit points, you can use a focus point and a free action to restore 10d4 plus 20 hit points. That's a potential 60 hit points. It's not amazing at level 20, but that's probably about a fifth of your health. What's unfortunate is this isn't a guaranteed save. If the attack would still deal enough damage through your heal to drop you to zero, you still fall unconscious. Additionally, you can't use this twice in one encounter, and even if you still have focus points, you need to refocus or reach your next daily preparations in order to cast this again. It also doesn't work if you're targeted by a death effect such as Disintegrate. While we're on the subject of this level 19 focus spells that lets you stave off death once, I would like to bring everybody's attention to the level 1 
orc feet, orc ferocity. That is a reaction that can completely prevent you from going down to zero hit points. It still has the same stipulation where, should you be targeted by a death effect that would immediately kill you, you can't use it. And sure, you don't regain hit points. But there are actually situations where you would take so much damage as a champion that the heal from Hero's Defiance would not be enough to keep you alive. Whereas Orc Ferocity, it doesn't matter how much damage you take, you could take 75 damage at 2 hit points, but as long as you haven't used it that day, Orc Ferocity lets you hang on with 1 hit point. Am I saying this is better? No. It's also only once per day instead of once per refocus. But I am saying that this is level 1, and this is level 19. I'm gonna leave it at that. But now we get to move on to the champion feats. Thankfully, since we did part 1, we got through all the class features in less than 20 minutes. I think that's a new record. <laughs> Starting off with level 1's Deity's Domain. This lets you pick any domain spell listed under your deity. Now, if you haven't already, I highly recommend checking out this video from way back, back when I had long hair in my old apartment, where I go over all of the Cleric and Champion Deity Focus spells. Because 90% of them are garbage. But yeah, you get a new Focus spell. What's awful about this feat is you do not get a new Focus Point. This stands out to me as most feats and features that give you a new focus spell also give you a new focus point to expand your pool and let you use it more. But not Deity's Domain, and I just double-checked the errata. It's not fixed in there either. So Deity's Domain does not expand your focus pool to two focus points. That's miserable. Not worth it at all. Ranged Reprisal sounds cool at first, and then you realize it's not. Only Paladins can take this, and it's a direct upgrade to their Retributive Strike. If you can trigger Retributive Strike, but your enemy happens to be 5 feet out of reach, let's say you have a normal melee weapon, and they're 10 feet away, well, as long as they're exactly 10 feet away, you can take the step action and then strike. Kinda nice. Additionally, if you have a weapon with reach, and they're exactly 15 feet away, you can still take the step action and then attack with your reach weapon. The main selling point for this is you can use Retributive Strike, with a ranged weapon. How cool is that? You can have a crossbow at the ready, or like a composite longbow, and then assist an attack of opportunity from a range. Wouldn't that be amazing? It's not. This does not remove the stipulation that both your ally and enemy need to be within 15 feet of you. So sure, you can use your short bow, but you have to be 15 feet away from the enemy in order to use it. At this point, you might as well just be in melee. You're only 15 feet away. There's no advantage to that. Again, just a lame feat. It's fine to extend the reach of your attacks of opportunity from this, which is nice. It gives you an extra 5 foot of reach to make the attack of opportunity with Retributive Strike. But the whole ranged weapon thing? Total flop. No reason to take it. Unimpeded Step is a fine upgrade to the Liberator's reaction. You can allow your target to take the step action, even if they're in difficult terrain. Normally you can't take the step action in difficult terrain. With this feat, they can when you use your reaction. Weight of Guilt is no contest, the single best first level feat in the core rulebook. The Redeemer upgrades their reaction. Now, instead of only inflicting Enfeebled, this can now inflict Enfeebled or Stupefied. So if you're fighting a spellcaster and they're still within reach of you and your ally to activate your reaction, obviously enfeebling a spellcaster isn't going to be super helpful. But if you can stupefy them, well that increases the chance of them failing a spell in the future and just giving them a minus to all of their intelligence, wisdom, and charisma based checks and DCs. Very good. In the APG we have a feat that really shouldn't exist. It's a great feat, honestly, but it's so unnecessary. Desperate prayer. As a free action, once per day, if you have zero focus points, you gain a focus point. Or, you could have just made it so Deity's Domain gives us a second focus point. I'm sure this must have been their way of making up for that or something, but all this would do for you at level 1 is let you cast Lay on Hands a second time in one combat, which is fine, I guess, an extra 6 points of healing and AC bump for one round. It's cool, I like that it's a free action, and this will be useful no matter what level you are. It's not a bad feat, but why not just let us get a second focus point in our pool? <laughs> Iron Repercussions is 
absolutely outstanding and makes the tyrant's reaction probably the single strongest of every champion. When an enemy refuses to obey your iron command, instead of dealing 1d6 mental damage, you can deal 1d6 persistent mental damage. And this still scales with level. The amount of damage you deal is completely unchanged. This means at level 9, you don't just deal 3d6 mental damage. You deal 3d6 persistent mental damage that cannot be saved against or resisted in any way. If they refuse to kneel to your reaction, they just have 3d6 mental damage. Every turn, even if they resist it, you can just apply it again if they attack you. Or, if they're already affected by it, you can just deal the normal mental damage. This is insane! The damage output on this is completely unmatched by any other type of champion. At level 1, 1d6 consistent, persistent damage is ridiculous. Look at something like the Produce Flame cantrip on a spellcaster. That deals 1d4 persistent fire damage only on a critical hit. This deals 1d6 persistent mental damage pretty much every round, so long as you get attacked. Ongoing selfishness for the Desecrator is okay, and only helpful if you're being attacked multiple times by the same target. After using Selfish Shield and gaining resistance to the triggering damage, you keep half of that resistance against all of the target's damage until the end of its turn. Now if this lasted until the end of its next turn, this would be pretty good. Unfortunately, it only lasts until the end of the current turn, so you've already been hit once, so the chances of you getting hit again, especially as a bulky champion, are already kind of low. And even if you do get hit again, the damage resistance is so negligible. At first level, it only becomes one damage resistance. Let's look at it at a higher level. Let's look at it at level 5. You'll be resisting roughly 7 damage on the initial hit, and then 3 damage for the rest of that creature's turn. At most, this is going to resist an extra 3 damage on that one turn, maybe. Not a great feat, especially compared to the Tyrant. Vicious Vengeance is not enough, Paizo! The Anti-Paladin's Reaction, which deals 1d6 damage to themselves, so they can deal 1d6 damage to their target, now gains a bonus to damage dealt to the enemy, just equal to the number of damage dice? That's plus one! The tyrant gets to make it persistent, which will theoretically, on average, at least double the total damage, and the anti-paladin deals one more damage? This doesn't fix anything! You could still roll a six on yourself and roll a one on the opponent. Yes, now, on average, the opponent takes one more damage than you. Oh, two more damage at level 5. You know what would have been good enough? I think it would have been balanced and fine if this let you add your level to the damage. I don't think that would have been overpowered. Level 2, you get to deal 1d6 to yourself, 1d6 plus 2 to the enemy. That's fine. Level 5, you deal 2d6 to yourself, 2d6 plus 5 to the enemy. I don't think that's overpowered. But no, at level 5, it's 2d6 plus 2. That's not enough. I think your level would have been fine. Maybe it's imbalanced in some way that I'm not seeing. I don't know. I'm often wrong, so please tell me if I'm wrong in some way. I've never seen anybody who's like, yeah, the anti-paladin reaction, that's, uh, that's good. <laughs> Paizo, seriously, I love you. I, I only crap on you like this because I care. <laughs> Level two, where we start getting into the really bad stuff. I'm going to make an enemy of Paizo today. They're never going to sponsor me at this rate. <laughs> Divine Grace overall is really good, probably one of the better early game paladin feats. If you attempt a saving throw against a spell effect, you can use your reaction to give yourself a plus two circumstance bonus. That's really good. Especially because it can be any saving throw, so long as the effect is coming from a spell, this is incredibly versatile and very, very helpful. I'm gonna talk about Dragon Slayer Oath, Fiend's Bane Oath, and Shining Oath all at the same time, because they're all the same feat. The only difference is Shining Oath gives you bonuses against Undead, Fiend's Bane gives you bonuses against Fiends, and Dragon Slayer gives you bonuses against Furries. They all also add an extra tenet, which is basically, Hey, you gotta stop him! That's your tenet! If you see him, do it! 
they all grant the same bonus. If you're a paladin, you get plus four to your damage against either dragons, fiends, or undead, and this increases with your proficiency once you reach master to plus six. If you're a redeemer, the damage reduction gets increased from two plus your level to seven plus your level if the triggering damage is from a dragon or a fiend or an undead. And the liberator's reaction grants your ally an extra plus four to their saving throw to escape from an effect from a dragon or a fiend or an undead. Vengeful Oath is the actually good oath versus the other three we were talking about because it functions differently. This one just gives you a tenant to hunt down and exterminate all evil, which is basically already a paladin tenant. This is also only available to paladins for some reason. I really don't know why this is limited to paladins because it makes your lay on hands spell really cool. It adds an extra effect to the focus spell where you can now use lay on hands to deal damage to a creature, even if they're not undead. The caveat is that you have to have witnessed this creature committing an inherently evil act. If you see a creature beating up and robbing innocents, you can now use Lay on Hands to damage them as though they were undead. And that's so cool! Why is this only for paladins? This is also one of the only sources of good damage that can harm a good creature. What's amazing about this is if something attacks your ally, you can use this to hurt them. If you're fighting angels in some really cool good versus good story where no one's technically in the wrong and the angel hurts your ally, well, guess what? You can use Lay on Hands to hurt this angel with good damage. It's so cool! Conceited Mindset is a really interesting feat. You get a permanent plus two to all saving throws against mental effects. Should you ever succeed, you automatically critically succeed. But because of your hubris as an evil champion, should you fail your saving throw, you automatically critically fail. This is cool, this is risky, and I never see, I want to see more feats like this, where it has a really powerful bonus, but a really bad downside. Like, odds are, you should succeed all of your mental saves. You're already an expert at will saves, and you're getting a permanent plus two. But should you fail, ooh, you're failing. <laughs> Basically roll a dice and they're half ones and half twenties. It's great. Hey, you know what would be cool in the APG for Pathfinder? Let's add another oath that works exactly like the last three, but this one's for aberrations. They'll love that. I've talked this over with my friend Critbox. Link to his channel right here. I can't take credit for this because it was him and I together that came up with this. But I think what would be really cool is if all of these different oaths were one feat, and during your daily preparations, you could pick one. If you knew you were going to fight a dragon, you could swear to defeat dragons that day. If you knew you were going into a crypt, you could swear to defeat the undead that day. Pray to your deity, let them know what you plan to do, and they grant you that magical divine prowess against that target. Why do these need to be four separate feats? Light Slayer Oath is incredibly lame and just feels lazy on Paizo's part. I'm sorry, Paizo. You gain the tenet that you have to kill angels. Anytime you see a Celestial, you gotta kill them. They're, they're too good. They're too nice. The only bonus you get from this is a little tiny bonus to your extra strike damage after using your reaction. If you remember, whenever you use your reaction on a target as an evil champion, your strikes at level 1 deal 1 additional damage to that target. And this only goes up at levels 9 and 16. Well, now instead of dealing 1, 2, and 3 bonus damage, you deal 2, 4, and 6 bonus damage at the respective levels. Level 4's Aura of Courage makes you super anti-frightened. Whenever you receive the Frightened condition, it's automatically lowered by 1, so you can only actually become frightened if you're afflicted with Frightened 2. Additionally, at the end of your turn, when you would reduce the Frightened condition on yourself, you also reduce it for all allies within 15 feet. So if any of your allies are frightened one and your turn ends, then they become frightened zero. Very, very phenomenal effect. Divine health is fine. I think this should have been a champion passive that all good champions get, like they do in 5e D&D. You get a plus one against all disease saving throws, and should you uh, succeed against a disease effect, you critically succeed instead. Mercy is such a cool concept but it should not cost an action. Mercy augments your Lay on Hands spell and lets your Lay on Hands, in addition to healing and boosting armor class, lets you attempt to counteract any paralysis or fear effect on the target. 
very cool. The downside is that this takes an action to augment, like, meta magic. It is meta magic. So if you need to move up to your ally, your entire turn is going to be walk up to them, mercy, lay on hands, and then they get the extra saving throw against the paralysis effect. It's not bad by any means, but this is going to devote your entire turn to aiding your ally. Whereas if this just permanently upgraded your Lay on Hands, I think it'd be cool. Remember, Lay on Hands is still a focus spell, so you can only do this at this level once per encounter anyway. I don't know why this needed to take an action. Accelerating Touch, on the other hand, does not take an action and augments your Lay on Hands in a pretty cool way. It's great for engaging and it's great for getting away. Should you cast Lay on Hands on someone, then in addition to the plus 2 to armor class, they also get a plus 10 foot speed boost until the end of their next turn. This is amazing. If your rogue needs to make a hasty exit, or your fighter just needs to get in there, this is an amazing way to start or escape a fight. You can even use this on yourself. Great feat. Aura of Despair is way better than Aura of Courage. All enemies within 15 feet of you, the evil champion, get a minus one to all saving throws against fear. What this means is that you can make a very effective demoralized champion, and as long as you're up close and personal with the enemy, that's effectively a plus one to all intimidation checks. Fantastic. Additionally, so long as the creature ends its turn within 15 feet of you, it cannot reduce its frightened condition below one. If you combine this with the right archetype to get sticky and get some of the feats that let you follow enemies as they try to run, this could lead to some fantastic permanent frightened condition builds, which I think could be a lot of fun. Unfortunately, it's locked behind evil champions, but, you know, it's not impossible. Shout out to all the comments, by the way. Thank you for giving me crap. I should not have said the tyrant is impossible to play. It's very difficult to roleplay, but I shouldn't say, I shouldn't have ever said you cannot do it. That was incredibly wrong of me. Thank you for bringing that up in the comments. I appreciate you. Cruelty, the opposite of mercy. Are you sensing a theme here? Similar to mercy, you spend an action to augment your touch of corruption, and should the target fail their saving throw, they become enfeebled one for one minute. This, in my opinion, is way better than Mercy and actually warrants the extra action. Inflicting Enfeebled 1 on its own isn't amazing, but for one full minute, that's crazy. That's the entire encounter. So you can just reduce all the damage they deal by one. You put this on a Desecrator champion with Selfish Shield who's already reducing damage they take? Amazing. Attack of Opportunity. This is just if you're not a Paladin and you want an Attack of Opportunity reaction, take it. The downside is if you use Attack of Opportunity, you can't use your Champion Reaction. There's almost no reason to take this. If you're a Redeemer or a Liberator, this would be better on a Liberator because you're not always going to fight something that is going to grab or restrain. But if you're a Redeemer, you're going to be wanting to reduce damage, not dealing damage. It's unfortunate, but you just don't have enough reactions to make use of this. Litany Against Ra Wrath? Litany Against Wrath grants you a new focus spell and finally gives you a new focus point. Good lord! Litany Against Wrath, for one action, targets one evil creature within 30 feet. They make a will save. Should they critically succeed, nothing happens. Should they even normal succeed their saving throw, then the next time in the next round, they deal damage to a good creature... They take 3d6 good damage, so you cast this on a demon, and that demon attacks any of your good allies, well that demon takes 3d6 damage. The failure is not all that much better, the duration is still one round, but now every time they deal damage, they take 3d6 good damage. So if they attack you twice in one turn, and hit twice in that turn, they're taking 6d6 good damage. That's really good. <laughs> That's a pun. The critical failure isn't amazing. This is sort of a focus spell where you know what you're gonna get. Whether success or crit failure, it's not a huge difference. If they crit fail, they become enfeebled too, but this almost works against itself, because this causes their attacks to take a minus two to hit. Now that's not a bad thing, but you almost want them to hit at this point to take the damage. Also a kind of sad is that on a critical failure, they don't take double damage. They still only take 3d6 when they hit someone. At least if they hit someone, they're dealing less damage. Loyal Warhorse, this matures your animal companion if you took the Divine Ally Steed, which is just really, really good, because maturing an animal companion makes them so much stronger. Shield Warden, you can use Shield Block on an adjacent ally to reduce the damage they take so long as your shield was raised. It's fine, I guess. Smite Evil is really good. 
However, it's only good if you're fighting purely evil enemies. You spend one action to enchant your weapon to deal four bonus good damage on anyone you strike. Additionally, if that target you hit attacks any of your allies, it extends the duration of this effect, so you don't need to spend an action to reactivate it. This damage is increased to 6 if you're a master. Now the problem with this is it is good damage. So unlike the Lay on Hands caveat from earlier that could hurt angels, this only hurts evil creatures. Even a neutral creature will not be affected by good damage. So keep that in mind, this only works if you're fighting inherently evil creatures. And so Nonat rambled. He complained and he cried. He just could not see it no matter how hard he tried. He said, they're too weak, and he ranted some more. He went on so long that this video's been torn. There'll be a part three of this champion guide. For his own opinions, Nonat could not hide. So patience be with us tomorrow, my friend. The rest of the feats, his opinions, the end.